Welcome back to Datarama, and we're looking at one or two letters now. This one comes in from Cambridge, of all places. Someone who's written into the competition says, My computer tells me that the answer to life, the universe, and everything is 81. Or, if you don't use all capital letters, 54. What have you got, General? Well, I always thought it was 42, but uh, an answer for the ZX81 competition floppy disk from Gareth Jones of Abergavenny, and he says that uh, all our programmes load first time, which is good to hear. Well, see what you make of this one. This is this week's competition. Up to now, they've been mainly fairly simple programmes because, of course, during a radio show, you don't want to have five minutes of screeching because it will turn people off. So, of course, we have to keep them fairly short and this limits the complexity of the programmes we can put out. But we have managed to squeeze rather interesting programmes out of 30-second uh, data bursts. Um, we tend to put out uh, competitions uh, in which the listener has to uh, decode certain things within the, uh, the, the competition. For example, it might be a programme which won't run until they've done something to the programme. Once they've done that, uh, taking out line 20 or whatever it is, and then the programme runs, they are a rev the, the answer is revealed to them, and they then have to send that in to us as a competition entry. We've also put out s short games, um, things for lining up your television set and so on. Uh, and also, the first, the first one we put out was a picture of a girl. This is supposed to be Cheryl Ladd, doesn't really look anything like her. But um, we put that out coded for various micros and, and we got these printouts back from people who said, you know, it works, great, congratulations. Are there any problems with it? Surprisingly, when we did our first tests on this months and months ago, we found that it loaded first time off medium wave, which is, you probably uh, realise, has got a very, very limited bandwidth and has all sorts of interference and so on at night. We did our test at about two in the morning, and even with the foreign stations beaming in on the same frequency, we still had no problems loading. Well, a couple of weeks ago, the BBC launched a new service on CFAX to provide free computer software. The manager of this service is Lawson Brown. Tell us about it, Lawson. Telesoftware, as far as the BBC is concerned, is involved with transmitting computer programs and data using the ordinary television signal and CFAX pages. Here we have an ordinary television set, and we can flick through the channels. And the picture's been adjusted so that we can see an area of screen that we don't normally see with our ordinary uh, pictures that we watch. There are four lines of dots going across the top of that screen, and that's digital information that's transmitted. An ordinary teletext set would decode that and turn it into the CFAX pages that you can usually call up with a handset. Now, because it's digital, we can equally well feed that output into a microcomputer. And to do that, we need an adapter of some description to take the information and put it into memory. We just unplug the aerial from the television set itself, plug the output from the microcomputer into it, and the aerial lead into the adapter. Select the appropriate channel and tell the computer we're going to use teletext. So this adapter would actually convert a perfectly ordinary television set, not a teletext set, into a, a teletext set? No, it will even convert, um, it will convert an ordinary set and it will also convert an ordinary monitor. Ah. You don't have to have a teletext set at all. Nice. Now, the simplest How much does it cost? Way, it's uh, just over £200. The simplest way to use the unit is as an ordinary teletext receiver. Very expensive one, of course, but, and we can call up the ordinary CFAX or any other teletext page that's being transmitted by any other broadcast company. The exciting thing we can do with it, of course, though, is to download software. And to do that, we call up the page number on which I know there's a program. If you don't know which programs are being transmitted, you can look up the index on page 701 of CFAX. And as CFAX cycles, the page will be picked up and that program will be downloaded into the memory of the microcomputer. It's, it's going through really like a carousel, as you like. It, yes, it is. It, it's very much like a, a carousel slide projector the way uh, CFAX is transmitted. We must have dropped in at rather a wrong point. It's taking Yes, it's coming it down now. We can get about 1K of software for technical people that are watching onto a single frame. Mm -hmm. And because we're limited by CFAX access time, then that downloading time is about 12 and a half seconds for each frame. You can get a big program down in five minutes. And what sort of programs are you sending down? 
a very wide range of programs. In the initial stages, a lot of the software is going to be educational. Mm -hmm. We're getting support for the service from Microelectronics Program and from Brighton Polytechnic Faculty of Education who are carrying out an experiment. And we're particularly interested in the sort of software that is not available by other means. One of the advantages of this system is that it does allow access to ordinary CFAX data. So we can actually grab the information that's put onto CFAX pages and process them by simple programs. It's that loaded pro now, can we run right. it? That program's downloaded, and if we just run it, we should see a simple program to demonstrate how we can actually do that. It's all on time delays, so. Let's take in the Financial Times Index, Friday's close from a CFAX page. It's now waiting for today's recipe to appear. So that's kind of like a menu program that's going into various other pages of CFAX, pulling in the data and assembling it so you can actually see that's it. That's exactly right, and it is very simple. That's accessed from within an ordinary basic program. No need for machine code or assembly or anything like that. Clearly, you wouldn't be able to do that sending a program down on the radio. But let's go back to Mr. Sampson's question. Why do you transmit programs on radio as well as sending it out on CFAX? Because the sort of service we wanted is far more sophisticated than what was possible over the radio system. As was said by, Mr. S uh, by the film interview, they are limited to fairly short pieces of software for obvious reasons, the noise and so on. One of the important factors that this adapter gives us as well over radio is error checking. And every page that's downloaded is error checked as it comes down. That means that you never download a program with a bug in it. So that if, if it was sent over the radio, you could actually receive it and then run it, and you wouldn't know whether there was a bug in the program or there was a bug in the transmission of the data. That's right. If you get a bug now, it's a bug in the program. It's not a bug in transmission. That's guaranteed. It still seems a lot of money. I, I still quite, can't quite see why people shouldn't take the advantage of uh, having it on an ordinary receiver. Can you do it as well? Certainly, as far as um, with the radio transmissions, there are transmissions going on with short pieces of software, and that's being done for educational broadcasts and so on. But this service is completely based on the whole approach to the system rather than single, small programs. Is it only for the BBC Micro at the moment? At the moment, it is. The Micro is the only unit that has a teletext adapter available for it. But technically, we can transmit software in any language or for any machine. So you would do that, would you? Um, when other machines had adapters? This would be up to the manufacturer to come along and talk to us and say that uh, he was providing this service and he could guarantee a reasonable audience and obviously some sort of software support. We would then discuss fairly closely whether we could offer him transmissions for his machine. I'm a bit worried about uh, free software. I always think that something you get for nothing is worth precisely what you pay for it. Also, it could deter people from actually making an investment to really write first-class software and block it. Who's actually paying for this free software? Is it me as a license holder? No, it isn't. The software that we're having produced to go with particularly our broadcast series is being commissioned by the television service. Of course, the adapter and so on does provide an income anyway. Um, it, we're also producing a kind of software that's not normally available, so we don't see ourselves in direct competition with the ordinary software market. We can, of course, provide a software maintenance and data service for the market that's never been available to any other publisher. I see. Well, thank you very much, Lawson. Um, I think we've been so fortunate so far in that not one micro has broken down and uh, nothing has um, gone wrong so far, except my attention has been drawn. Our clock stopped, <laughs> which just shows what happens when you use low technology.